Uh, I want you to open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 16, where we're able to indulge rather in, before we get into the life of Hezekiah, we're going to first, in our first session, look at his father, Ahaz, because it will set for us the context for the king that we're due to study this week. We read in 2 Kings 16 and verse 1, in the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. 20 years old was Ahaz when he began to reign. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not that which was right in the sight of Yahweh his God, like David his father. Just have a look at the graphic that you may see on the screen there, because when we the age differences we're given, we notice... Is my voice blowing up the microphone? It's next door, okay. Do you want me to carry on as if nothing's happened? Okay, nothing's happened. We're going to carry on. This is great. So look at that graphic, and what you'll notice is that uh, we can work out that because when Hezekiah comes to the throne, after his father Ahaz has reigned for 16 years, he is aged 25, that when we do the basic maths, which as a primary school teacher I'm good at, we can go back and see that when Ahaz began to reign, his son Hezekiah was already aged nine. Now when we think about that, Ahaz was 20 when he began to reign, and there aren't many 20-year-olds who have a nine-year-old son. It tells us that this king had his son Hezekiah when he was just aged 11. And it enables us to reflect upon the fact that we're looking at the most wicked king to date in the history of the kingdom of Judah. He was a depraved young man, a depraved prince, who from an extremely young age indulged himself in ways utterly abhorrent to the God of Israel. We can see he was only 11 when he had Hezekiah. And so we're not surprised to see in verse 3 that he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. So this king, despite the fact that Jotham, his father, was a faithful man, He took his inspiration, not from his father, Jotham, rather from the wicked kings of Israel. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Yea, he made his son to pass through the fire. We shall reflect a little later in our studies that we think that that could well have been Hezekiah and others besides. According to the abominations of the heathen, whom Yahweh cast out from before the children of Israel, He sacrificed and burned incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. This was a wicked, wicked king. And he ushered into the nation of Judah a time of terrible darkness, making his son, quite likely Hezekiah, to pass through the fire, sacrifice and burning incense in high places, on the hills and every green tree, Just come with me to the Chronicles record. Keep a marker here. We'll be back here shortly. But come with me to 2 Chronicles because we need to make use of both the records in our studies this week to really draw out as much as we can from particularly the life of Hezekiah, of course. But this morning, Ahaz. In 2 Chronicles 28, we read in verse 24 that Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God. He cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God. He shut up the doors of the house of Yahweh. He made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem. In every several city of Judah, he made incense. He made high places to burn incense unto other gods and provoked to anger Yahweh, God of his fathers. So we're getting the picture of this awful king with no respect for the God of Israel. Rather, he's looked for inspiration to the kings of Israel, the wicked kings of Israel. And 
therefore, we're not surprised to see that the man that chooses to act in this way has a reign of utter chaos. Chaos and confusion. Let's just stick in 2 Chronicles 28, where we read in verse 5, Wherefore, because of the choices he made, Yahweh his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria, and they smote him. So you think above Judah you've got Israel, and above Israel you've got Syria. And the Syrians come and smite him and carried away great multitude of them captives and brought them to Damascus. And he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel. You want to be like the kings of Israel? I'll deliver you into the hand of the king of Israel, who smote him with a great slaughter. Pekah, the son of Remaliah, slew in Judah 120,000 in one day. I mean, just reflect on the crisis we're seeing at the moment in the Middle East and the horror around the death toll in Gaza. We're not yet at 40,000. We're not suggesting it's anything other than awful. 120,000 in one day that Pekah, the king of Israel, slew when he came into Judah during the reign of of Ahaz. We keep reading. We read in verse 8 that the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons, and daughters, and took also away much spoil from them and brought them, brought the spoil to Samaria. We'll come back to that. You can see 200,000 are taken into captivity. 120,000 dead. 200,000 into captivity, 320,000 people suddenly leaving the kingdom of Judah. If that's not enough, go to verse 16. At that time did King Ahaz send unto the kings of Assyria to help him. For again, the Edomites had come and smitten Judah and carried away captives. The Philistines also had invaded the cities of the low country in the south of Judah and taken Beth Shemesh and Aijalon and Gedaroth and Shoko with the villages thereof and Timnath with the villages thereof, Gimzo also in the villages thereof, and they dwelt there. And the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, what do you notice? King of Israel. He wasn't the king of Israel. He was the king of Judah. But what choice did he make? He chose to take inspiration from the kings of Israel, verse 2. So you connect in your margin verse 19 and verse 2. Because Ahaz wanted to be as the kings of Israel. And so the divine record records him as a king of Israel, a wicked king. And we see the chaos and confusion from the north. From, from the southeast, from the southwest, because of his wickedness in not following Yahweh, the God of Israel. Now, when we see in verse 8 that 200,000 women, sons, and daughters were taken away, that is simply an enormous number of people. Just to give you an idea, this is the largest refugee camp in the Middle East today. Uh, this is in Jordan, and there are 80,000 people in that refugee camp. 200,000. That's one and a half times as many, right? It's an incredible number of people, isn't it? Or two and a half times as many, I should say, shouldn't I? It's an enormous number of people that are taken into captivity. And of course, they become refugees. And what happens, and we're just going to just very briefly reflect on this, because I think it's important in our times, that we see that when they come 
to Samaria, at the end of verse 8, you notice that they brought the spoil of these people to Samaria. Verse 12, that certain of the heads of the children of Ephraim, Azariah the son of Jehanan, Berechiah the son of Meshelamoth, Jehezekiah the son of Shalom, and Amasa the son of Hadlai, stood up against them that came from the war and said to them, You shall not bring in the captives hither. For whereas we've offended against Yahweh already, you intend to add more to our sins and to our trespass. For our trespass is great and there's fierce wrath against Israel. So the armed men left the captives and the spoil before the princes and all the congregation. So the soldiers just say, okay, fine. And they leave them there. And the soldiers march on. And these 200,000 refugees are left there in this place with the princes. And the men which were expressed by name, so that is the men, of course, from verse 12. The men which were expressed by name rose up and they took the captives and with the spoil clothed all that were naked among them and arrayed them and shod them and gave them to eat and carried all the feeble of them upon asses and brought them to Jericho, the city of palm trees, to their brethren. Then they returned to Samaria. So they were able to return them to Jericho. Now, we don't have time to to go there. Some of you will already have this in your margin. But if you don't, I suggest you make a note of Luke 10, verses 33 and 34. And just quickly reflect what Luke 10 is about. Someone tell me, what's Luke 10, verse 33 and 34? It's the parable of the, the Good Samaritan, right? It's the parable, isn't it, of the Good Samaritan, where the Lord Jesus Christ tells us about the way that the the Good Samaritan treated the man who was so badly treated by his brethren. And so these men are the the early runners of the Good Samaritan. They're, they're, They're whom the Lord Jesus Christ draws the story from in their care for these refugees. And brothers and sisters, we live in a world, don't we, where... You'll see in the next election in the United States that borders may be the number one item on the agenda in the way we treat refugees. It's a major issue in Europe. Uh, Nigel Farage, the, the leader of the Reform Party in the UK this week said that our borders should be the number one item on any political party's manifesto. We don't get caught up with politics. We don't go to war, just as these men didn't. But how we treat our neighbors matters to our God. And how we treat those of the house of Israel. Because these men knew that the men of war were offending Yahweh, the God of heaven, in the way that they were treating his people. And so we just briefly, as an interlude, if you like, in the middle of our study, because here it is in this chapter, just reflect, how do we treat those of the Israel of God? Do we care for them and look after them? Do we bear their burdens? Just look at the names of the men who were named, the men which were expressed by name. Look at their names. Azariah, helped of Yah. Berechiah, blessed of Yah. Jehezekiah, Yar is strength. Amasa, burden bearer. Are we prepared to bear the burdens, to go for strength and help and blessing to others as Yahweh our God has blessed us? Now these men stood out in this time of darkness. We live in the times of Gentile darkness. Are we prepared to stand out to hold up, to hold fast to the things of the truth. As of Ahaz, well, he was told to go and meet Isaiah the prophet. Will you come with me to Isaiah chapter 7? The nation's in a terrible mess. It came to pass... Isaiah 7 and verse 1. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Isaiah, king of Judah, 
that Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. Now, that's of real significance, because during the time of Ahaz, yes, they came down, Israel and Syria came down into Judah, but Jerusalem was not taken. Jerusalem is still a city that is, as it were, a city of refuge for any that are faithful. So they come down, but they don't prevail against Jerusalem. And it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. So we know that Ephraim is a synonym, don't we, for Israel. So Syria is confederate with Israel. And his, who's his? Well, his is the subject, verse 1, Ahaz. So you might circle his, circle Ahaz, and connect them together in verse 1 and verse 2. Ahaz's heart was moved. And the heart of his people, as the trees of the wood, are moved with the wind. His heart was moved. Now, ordinarily speaking, brothers and sisters... If we think someone's heart has been moved, we would expect, wouldn't we, to see a response that would turn perhaps from being unfaithful to faithful, because the heart has been moved. And in our lives, every now and again, someone is able to say something to us that's able, as it were, to to, to get to the core of us. They're able to touch our heart, that that our heart is moved as the wind moves through the trees. And when that happens to us, we ought to see that as a signal to take evasive action, to, to perhaps move in a different direction, to respond to the fact that our heart has been moved. For wicked King Ahaz, his heart was moved, but this man is faint-hearted. So we read in verse 3, that Yahweh said to Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shear Jashub thy son. Now Shear Jashub, your margin will tell you, means a remnant shall return. So it's no coincidence that that God tells Isaiah to go, and though he's going to meet the king, take with you, put him on your shoulders, hold him in your arms, your little boy, Shear Jashub, whose name means a remnant shall return. Because Ahaz needs to know that although there are going to be extraordinary challenges in the kingdom of Judah, a remnant will return. That's the sign that you'll bring in taking your son. And I want you to go, not just, don't go to the palace to meet him. Go, verse 3, to the end of the conduit of the upper pool. So he's going to, have you look on the map there, to, to not far from the Gihon Spring, the, the, the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the Fuller's Field. Now, we shall see that this becomes important later in our studies, and most of you, I'm sure, know why when we come to the life of Hezekiah. But we'll pick that up in due course. He said to him, so this is now what Isaiah says to Ahaz, take heed and be quiet. Fear not, Neither be faint-hearted. For the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin with Syria and of the son of Remaliah, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, let's go up against Judah and vex it. Let's make a breach therein for us and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tobiel. So, so what he's told is there's a plot against you. There's a plot against you by the king of Israel, the very one you wanted to be like. He's plotting against you. And he's confederate with the king of Syria. And they're going to come against you. But Isaiah says, don't worry. 
these two, the two tails of these smoking firebrands. They're smoking firebrands. They're all smoke and no fire, right? You haven't got to worry about them. Put your trust in God, Ahaz. Moreover, verse 10, Yahweh spake again to Ahaz saying, ask thee a sign of Yahweh your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. And Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt Yahweh. This is not a faithful response. This isn't the response of a man who says, no, I mustn't ask of God a sign. I, I'm putting all my trust in him. God can see this king is faint-hearted. He can see that this king is weak. And so he offers to him in his loving kindness that he might have a sign. You remember later on, Hezekiah, faithful Hezekiah, who trusts in God more than any other king, he asks of God a sign. You remember the sundial. Ahaz, though, no, he's nothing like his son. He is faithless, and he refuses to ask the sign, ask for a sign. And so he's told of a prophecy that ultimately God will give a sign in that a virgin will conceive. Now, we know, of course, that that sign is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there have been some who've on the way suggested, well, you know, could this in the first instance be talking about Hezekiah? Well, it can't be. We know it can't be because Ahaz, verse 1, is already the king. And we know from the chronology that when Ahaz began to be the king, Hezekiah was already age nine. So it's nonsense to suggest in verse 14 that in the first place this son could be Hezekiah. It's not. This prophecy is directly and only about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now in verse 15, we see that Isaiah is speaking about Sheer Jashub. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child, Shear Jashub, shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the lamb that thou borest shall be forsaken of both her kings. So before Shear Jashub is much older, the kings of Israel and Syria, those lands that you hate, both those kings are going to be gone. The Lord, verse 17, Yahweh shall bring upon thee and upon thy people and upon thy father's house days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. Okay, so let's try to just pull together what we've seen here. That Ahaz is told to go, or Isaiah is told to go to meet Ahaz at the, uh, the upper pool, the highway of the fuller's field. We'll see later in our studies how important that particular place is. There, Isaiah gives him advice. Listen and be quiet, Ahaz. That advice is advice that some of us could use. It's certainly advice that I could take on quite often. Listen and be quiet. So often in our lives... We think that we've got the answers and the solutions, don't we? But what we have to be prepared to do is just stop. Listen. Listen to God's word. Listen to the support of our brothers and sisters around us. Be quiet. Don't feel the need to justify our positions. Just be quiet. And then we don't need to be faint-hearted. We can put our trust in God. Ahaz is then offered a sign. He refuses the sign. No, I don't need a sign. No, no, I'm not interested. He turns down a sign from Yahweh, his God. What a terrible thing to have done. I won't tempt God. And so Isaiah tells him, yes, there will be a sign of how God is going to ultimately deal with the problem of sin in the nation. 
through the Lord Jesus Christ. But for now, the child in Isaiah's arms, Sheer Jashub, before that child is able even to make choices about what's right and what's wrong, as a child develops, the two kings that you're worried about, the king of Syria, the king of Israel, they're going to be gone. But there is a king you do need to be well aware of. Because the angels are working behind the scenes. And the superpower of Assyria is looming large. And the king of Assyria is one you need to watch out for. And you need to put your faith and your trust in God. So what does Ahaz do? Will you come with me to 2 Kings 16, where we began. Verse 7. So, Isaiah has given him one piece of advice. The Assyrian is coming. You put your trust in God. So, Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria. The one thing he shouldn't have done. He's done it. He's gone. He's bypassed Israel. He's bypassed Syria. And he's got his messengers up to Assyria, to Tiglath-Pileser, saying, I am thy servant and thy son. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Syria and out of the hand of the king of Israel, which rise up against me. He's looking to the Assyrian to save him. And look what he does, verse 8. He, he took the silver and gold that was found in the house of Yahweh in the temple and in the treasures of the king's house and sent it for a present to the king of Assyria. Now, brothers and sisters, we're going to see that Hezekiah is going to reverse this. But we have to be challenged when we read something like this, that Ahaz offers himself as the servant of the king of Assyria. And we know and understand that the Assyrian kings, like the Babylonian kings or the Egyptian kings, represent in Scripture king sin. Keep a marker. And will you come with me to Romans chapter 6? where when the Apostle Paul writes to the Romans, and of course, the Roman system becomes king sin, he says in Romans 6 and verse 12, Let not sin therefore reign like a king in your mortal body that you should obey the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but yield yourselves to God. So what Ahaz is doing is he's yielding himself. He's offering himself as a servant and a son to king sin. We know that the gospel message allows us to be made the sons of God. And he says, I don't, not, not for me. I'll be your son to King Sin. I'll be your servant. What then? Verse 15. Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know you not that to whom you yield. Now the word yield is the word present. Whom you present yourselves. Servants to obey his servants you are, to whom you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness. Ahaz is offering himself to king sin and it's going to be to his death. And brothers and sisters, we come to Bible school, don't we? Because perhaps too often we do allow our hearts and our minds to wander off, to serve King Sin. But in the end, we have a choice. To whom you present yourself, that's who you are. You, you, we, we can't come to Bible school and, and sort of pretend to be one thing or another. Our God knows the thoughts and intents of all of our hearts. 
and to whom your heart presents itself each day. The choices that each of us, very much me too, make each day. That determines whose servants we are, whether of sin to death or of righteousness to life and to serve our God. Today, we've made the right choice. This week, we've made the right choice. The challenge is next week. Come back to 2 Kings 16. So he sends messengers up to Tiglath-Pileser, the king of Assyria. He sends the presents. And now King Ahaz himself went to Damascus. I want you to see how serious I am about serving you. So he bypasses Israel and Syria. You imagine that would have been a challenge in itself, that, that they, they didn't have a lot, they didn't think a lot of this king. And so to get the king from Judah up to Assyria would have been a challenge, but they've got him up there because he's determined. You know, there's no Air Force One in those days. You know, he, he's somehow getting up there because he's determined to get in front of the man who he has said, I am your son and I am your servant. And he goes to meet Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, verse 10, and saw an altar that was at Damascus. So he's actually met him in Syria because Tiglath-Pileser now has come so strong, he has now dealt with the Syrians. And Ahaz, as he comes into Damascus and he sees this altar, he looks at it and he thinks, well, I rather like that. And what he does, verse 10, King Ahaz sent to Urijah the priest the fashion of the altar and the pattern of it according to all the workmanship. So what he does is he sees this altar and it's very different to, oh, well, the, the boring altar that's been there forever in the temple in Jerusalem. This one, well, this one's so much more dynamic. It's, it's so much more interesting. We'll take this altar. And he gets the pattern and sends it to Urijah the priest. That Urijah the priest might build this very altar that King Ahaz, verse 11, has sent from Damascus. So Urijah the priest made it against King Ahaz, came from Damascus. So before Ahaz returns to Jerusalem, the altar is made. And when the king was come from Damascus, the king saw the altar, and the king approached the altar and offered thereon. Now, brothers and sisters, we need to comment on this. Because in Scripture, we're told of the importance of the pattern. And what Ahaz does is he takes the pattern of this Syrian altar here in Damascus and he takes the pattern of that altar and gives it to Urijah that he might make that exact pattern, that exact altar in Jerusalem, in the temple there. We know from the law that Moses was given the exact pattern. Good references to make note of. Exodus 25, verse 9 and verse 40. I've put them on the screen there. According to all that I show you, as they're, they're given the workings of the tabernacle, according to all that I show you, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments, even so shall you make it. What was given to them was according to the pattern. It, it, it wasn't something Moses dreamt up one night. It wasn't something that, that Bezalel, who I think we're going to hear about in one of our studies, what was able to just, through the Spirit, come up with. They were given a pattern. And look, thou shalt make them after their pattern, Exodus 25 and verse 40, which was showed thee in the mount. Ahaz ignores the pattern 
that has been passed down from David to Solomon in the making of the instruments of the temple. And he takes the pattern of the worship in Damascus and puts it in Jerusalem. We're reminded, brethren and sisters, of 2 Timothy chapter 1. Just, just quickly turn there. 2 Timothy 1. Keep your marker in the Old Testament, but 2 Timothy 1. We read in verse 14, verse 13 rather, hold fast the form. That word form is the Greek word pattern. So 2 Timothy 1 verse 13, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you've heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you, keep, it means guard through the Holy Spirit which dwelleth in us. So, brothers and sisters, let's just reflect for a moment. What does this mean spiritually for us? We're seeing tragically, even in the brotherhood, those that are going to Damascus. And in Damascus, seeing altars that look more dynamic, more exciting, more interesting than the worship that we have on a Sunday morning. We're seeing people wanting an, a completely open fellowship, not according to the pattern. And so we've got to use Bible school as a way to help us hold fast to the pattern of sound doctrine which has been given to you, which has been given to me. We've got to guard that which was committed to us before the Lord Jesus Christ returns. We cannot allow the altars of Damascus to come and sit in our ecclesias. You've got to make sure that Bible school is an opportunity to talk with others, to boost them and help them that when we go back to our ecclesias, we're more determined than ever before the Lord comes to hold fast to the pattern which has been given to us. Would you come back with me to the record in Kings, 2 Kings 16. So we see that Ahaz comes into Jerusalem, and he comes to the temple and he approached the altar and offered thereon and he burnt his burnt offering and his meal offering and poured his drink offering and sprinkled the blood of his peace offerings upon the altar. So, so this is his new altar. And he brought also the brazen altar, which was before the Lord, from the forefront of the house, from between the altar and, and the house of Yahweh and put it on the north side of the altar. So just to have a look again at the front here or the side where you can see a diagram, a simple diagram of the temple. And you see that when you come into the temple forecourt, the first thing that struck you was the brazen altar. But what does he do? He takes the brazen altar and he moves it, we're told, in verse 14, the end of verse 14, he put it on the north side of the altar his great altar from Damascus, the Syrian altar, he replaces it. Now, we could ask the question, why does he even do this? Why doesn't he just abolish the temple altogether? Why does he just set up a Syrian temple and do that? Well, we could ask the same question in the brotherhood. I'm sure you've asked the question of yourself sometimes of brothers and sisters who want to bring in entirely different ideas that are so different from the pattern that's set before us in Scripture. And you find yourself thinking, well, if you really truly do believe that, why, why don't you just go to another church? Not that we want that to happen, but... But that, if that's really what you believe, that isn't what's set out in the pages of Scripture. But what people want 
is this form of godliness. When the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, he said that people want a form of godliness, but they're denying the power thereof. And the power of the gospel message is in Scripture, in the pattern that we've been given. We choose to disregard that pattern. Well, there may be a form of godliness, but we are denying the power thereof. The only way to have a true relationship with God is through the brazen altar, is through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if that wasn't enough, verse 15, King Ahaz commanded Uriah the priest, saying, Upon the great altar burn the morning burnt offering and the, the evening burnt uh, meat offering and the king's burnt offering and his meat offering with the burnt offering of all the people of the land and their meat offering and their drink offering and sprinkle it upon all the blood of the burnt offering and all the blood of the sacrifice and the brazen altar shall be for me to inquire by. So, so we won't throw it in the bin because if I do need to just you know, make contact with God and, you know, inquire of him. Well, I'll I'll head in that direction. But, but, but this is what we're going to use for all of our sacrifices. It's terrible. Thus did Uriah the priest according to all that King Ahaz commanded. And King Ahaz now, see what he does next. Cut off the borders of the bases and remove the laver from off them and took down the sea from off the brazen oxen that were under it, and put it upon a pavement of stone. So so what he does is he now deals with the molten sea. Uh, the, the, The molten sea was a large, very large version of the laver that was in the tabernacle. So the first thing we come to is the brazen altar and then after that it's the laver or in the temple it was the molten sea but the molten sea this very large basin as you can see from that picture was set upon 12 oxen it was set upon the brazen oxen and we know that the oxen in scripture represent service Brazen represents man. And so the brazen oxen represented our service before God. The water, of course, represents the word. But what Ahaz has done is remove the importance of the word of God being set on service. And because he does that, well, we know from the Chronicles record we read earlier, soon the temple closes. Everything starts to fall apart. And brothers and sisters, that's what we see in ecclesial life. Those meetings that choose to to, to go easy on doctrinal matters, to not get too tied up with having to do the readings and And, you know, not not worrying too much about doing things decently and in order. When they become too casual, when service isn't required to be set on the word of God, well, things soon fall apart. Brother Stephen and Sister Lindsay and I were reflecting just yesterday of, tragically, ecclesias in our neck of the woods, the United Kingdom, who've taken that casual approach to ecclesial life and none of the children have come into the meeting. And so we've got to make sure that we hold fast this pattern. That we understand that the word of God, which is in our laps now, that that word should create in us change people that want to serve. Ahaz, he wasn't interested in that. He got rid of it. And he set it on a pavement of stone. What does stone represent in Scripture? Death. Well, that's what's going to happen. And what does he do? Verse 18. The covered way for the Sabbath that they'd built in the house 
and the king's entry without, turned he from the house of Yahweh for the king of Assyria. Just keep a marker here, but come to the Chronicles record again, to 2 Chronicles 28. To just see another little comment on this, verse 21 of 2 Chronicles 28. Ahaz took away a portion out of the house of Yahweh and out of the house of the king and out of the princes and gave it to the king of Assyria. But he helped him not. So what's he done? He's, he's allowed probably a, a garrison of the Assyrian army to have a room in the temple, in the king's house. He's got so little regard for everything that the temple ought to stand for. And so the people are in dire straits. Just come with me now in 2 Chronicles 28 to verse 22. But in the time of his distress, did he trespass yet more against Yahweh? This is that King Ahaz. He sacrificed the gods of Damascus, which smote him. He said, because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, therefore will I sacrifice to them, that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and of all Israel. Brothers and sisters, if we allow our ecclesias, our families, to get caught up with the gods of Syria, Damascus, if we lean on the king of Assyria and choose to serve him, we will not be helped. In the end, they'll be the ruin of us. In the end, everything falls apart. Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God. He cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God. What do the vessels represent? People. He shut up the doors of the house of the Lord and he made him altars in every corner of Jerusalem. It's in a terrible, terrible mess. So much so that in verse 19, we read that Yahweh brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel, for he made Judah naked. He made Judah naked. Now that word naked is used in the Proverbs. Just keep a marker here and come with me to Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29 and verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. He that keepeth the law, happy is he. The word perish, if you look in your margin, is the word naked. It's the same Hebrew word that we have in 2 Chronicles 28 And verse 19. Judah is made naked. Why? Because of King Ahaz. What should a king do? What should a leader do? The job of the leader is to set the vision. Is to give direction to the people. To to, to make sure that they're, they're moving in the right direction. Ahaz completely lost the vision. He lost sight of the pattern. And as such, the people were made naked. And so, brothers and sisters, as we draw our thoughts together for our morning session, let's just reflect. We need to only worship God in the way that he has asked of us. We don't bring our thinking, as it were, to ecclesial life. It's not about us. We leave behind us to serve God and to follow the pattern of sound doctrine laid out in the pages of Scripture. And so we've got to make sure in our family lives, in our ecclesial lives, there are no false altars. Nothing is coming in from Syria, from Assyria, 
from the northern kingdom of Israel. We've got to hold fast to that which is given to us in the word of God. We've got to make sure we do that. Because if we don't, your ecclesial hall will close. The doors will soon not open. And so in contrast, we've got to do everything we can to keep the doors of the ecclesia open. We've got to make sure that our ecclesial doors are open. We're going to see that Hezekiah is going to fix this in the first year, the first month of his reign. We've got to ensure that our worship to God is based on service. It isn't something that we simply do in turning up to church. We've got to have service each day to our God. Ahaz, he was prepared to get up to Assyria. He, he, he got into Damascus to show his allegiance to Tiglath-Pileser, the king of Assyria. How far are you prepared to go to show your allegiance to the God of heaven? You've done well by getting to Bible school. For some of you, you've traveled many miles to get here. Great. But how are we going to be next week? Who are we going to serve next week? We've got to ask ourselves, are we prepared to be different? In an age of chronic darkness, the days in which we live in, they're not much like the days of Hezekiah. They're more like the days of Ahaz. As we see the times of Gentile darkness coming to a close, are we prepared to behave like those men that were named in 2 Chronicles 28? In, like Azariah, Berechiah, Jehezekiah, Amasa, are we prepared to bear the burdens of others, to show love and support and kindness for those in the Israel of God who may be in trouble, who may be in need? And above all, we've got to make sure that we've got a vision that's burning brightly. Where there is no vision, the people will perish. You remember that what Ahaz did is when Isaiah had spoken to him, he went straight to Assyria to say, will you come and save me? Will you turn finally to Isaiah 35? We need a vision. In Isaiah 35 is written in the days of Hezekiah. And of course, the whole chapter is a vision of the blessings of the kingdom age. You remember our story started when Ahaz went to meet with Isaiah at the upper pool, the Gihon Spring, with Shir Jashub, his son. Shir Jashub means a remnant will return. And we read in Isaiah 35 of the vision that we've got to have burning in our minds if we're going to make sure that we learn from King Ahaz and, and not allow ourselves to go in any form of direction that he went in. Isaiah 35 and verse 7. The parched ground shall become a pool, the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitations of dragons, where each lay shall be grasses with reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and a, and a way, it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, the Assyrian is the lion, nor any ravenous beast shall go up upon thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of Yahweh shall return, sheer Jasher, and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads, and shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Just notice at the end of verse or verse four, say to them that say to them that have a fearful heart. Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. And so, brothers and sisters, we've got to put all our faith and all our trust on our God who will come and save us. Never allow ourselves to turn to the Syrians, to the Assyrians. 
Put your trust, as Hezekiah is going to show us tomorrow, in God.